Thank you all. Uh, thanks for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the uh, NMIMS. Um, and uh, thanks, Raul, for introducing me. Uh, what I thought I would do in the next 40 minutes and touch upon a few topics that I think is relevant from the uh, perspective of uh, you know, putting together a startup. And that's the context from where I'm coming from. Uh, there are a couple of disclaimers that I would like to make. Uh, it's uh, I come from a life sciences background uh, and the industry that I'm coming from is, uh, is, is pharma. Uh, and, uh, and, and lastly, uh, the, the disclaimer that I'm going to make is that probably somewhere along, I could sound a bit prescriptive. Uh, and I apologize for that, uh, for that tone if I slip into that. Um, Bugworks, uh, so we are a startup company located in Bangalore in a place called the Cellular Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms, CCAMP, which is located within the NCBS BioCluster, uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences. It's part of uh, the Department of Biotechnology Initiative, and uh, we're very fortunate to actually be housed inside that. Poor bug works anyway, and I thought I would share uh, 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 some sort of a levity here because when we started the company, uh, it was quite curious that uh, in terms of the reactions that we sort of elicited, uh, are we a fly swatting company? Uh, you know, are we one of those guys who make that you know sort of tennis rackets which 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 swats the mosquitoes, uh, bug sprays, uh, or are we actually a software company which fixes bugs in softwares? Uh, probably the most exotic one was, are we a gaming company? Unfortunately, to disappoint all of these uh, speculations, we actually are uh, a drug discovery company. And what we do is uh, basically uh, do antibiotic drug discovery, and we take from uh, concepts from the lab bench and to the patient in the bed. A little bit of background in terms of how we came about in terms of the bug works. There was a small team of scientists actually engaged in a company called Cellworks, uh, which is a modeling and simulation company. And within Cellworks, they were working on simulating infections and pretty much uh, computational methodologies. And uh, I was part of AstraZeneca during that time. And there was a collaboration between Cellworks and AstraZeneca for enabling drug discovery in AstraZeneca, where the cell works, uh, the very first uh, sort of grants that we got from the Department of Biotechnology was not in drug discovery, but to look at, can we engineer bacteria to, to make useful products such as green chemistry, biofuels, et cetera. And probably that's where the name bug works comes from, to make the bug work for us. And, uh, and while we were working with the green chemistry project, we also started, um, the Cellworks guys actually morphed a little bit, moved beyond just modeling and simulation, started doing some experimental work as well. And the infection work in Cellworks actually uh, carried on all the way till 2013 and was entirely funded through, uh, through a very prestigious grants such as the European Union Framework 7 or the Wellcome Trust. You know, Everything was going very nicely, smoothly, uh, modeling and simulation. They were, they were sort of plugging into some gaps in AstraZeneca and there was a nice collaboration going on. Well, things don't exactly go the way we plan. Uh, the first, there were three adverse events which happened and all of this sort of converged and they opened up an opportunity. The part one was my own personal journey, I quit AZ after nearly 20 years. And interestingly enough, I went through a, a, almost a year of futile attempts to find a, a suitable replacement job. Nobody found me palatable. Uh, I joined Cellworks as a consultant for their infection projects. The part two was Cellworks decided to close infection. And the group in Cellworks, which is working on infection decided, okay, let's spin this idea out. And possibly the one that we had the least bit of control was the fact that AstraZeneca decided to close infection as well. And this happened in early 2014 and the entire R&D uh, 
was was closed uh, in the uh, in, in India, and many drug discovery experts actually became available for hiring. A lot of them had, had worked with them and uh, you know worked in teams. So sort of these three events converged. The net result, Bugworks was actually born in early 2014. And, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, came together, Anand, myself, Janani and Shantanu. Uh, Janani, uh, who's actually uh, out there at the bottom of the slide, then subsequently went on to found her own uh, startup company called Biomonitor, which is a further spin out, again, working in the infection space. And the three of us, the three old uh, gentlemen stayed back to propel this. And our first draft of the business plan, as you can see, was basically a, a scribbled uh, A4 sheet. Uh, we took, put together something and, and, and there were probably already indications that the guy in the court obviously became the right candidate for the CEO. Uh, and and San Anand and myself and Shantanu put together and we started Bugworks. It's important that I, I spend a few word, uh, a few minutes in terms of team composition, right? One of the things that we learned very early on was for a startup, it's better to start as a team and not as an individual. While individual, brilliant individuals have fantastic technology and science ideas, it's usually uh, they hit a roadblock very soon uh, if when they try to battle it all on their own. And when I say it's as a team, ideally with heterogeneous skill sets, such that we actually complement each other, preferably non-overlapping technical and soft skills expertise. And most importantly, something very curiously which happened amongst us is that there's a complete bandwidth uh, uh, spectrum of the emotional aspects from a diehard optimist to a borderline pessimist, which is yours truly. Uh, this sort of combination sort of sets a balance in the team and makes it a vi very vibrant team. But most importantly, uh, the team is very aligned in terms of the overarching goal, the passion to succeed, respect for each other's strengths and an acknowledgement of each other's weaknesses. But that actually melds beautifully. This is a great team composition and, and we've been able to actually successfully uh, move the company, company forward. As you notice that we are not a typical startup. Uh, we're all 50 plus when we put this team together. So this is, these are not, uh, you know, your, uh, so they sort of, we, we have come with a lot of set ways, but it has worked to our advantage. The, 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 the heterogeneous skill sets, uh, Anand, the CEO, is very externally focused. Uh, he presents our case in, in, in global uh, forums, uh, makes the case for business case for actually making money out of antibiotics discovery, and very recently was at the G20 uh, Health uh, Summit in Tokyo. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is a, is a crazy uh, blue sky scientist who's a sort of fountainhead of creative ideas, uh, who constantly throws us new ways of looking at things uh, but he's always at a 30,000 foot. And, and that's, that's nice because uh, somebody has to be at the blue sky level. The other end of the spectrum is a very execution oriented program manager who makes sure that those wonderful blue sky ideas are actually broken down into parts which are executable and then monitoring things which are happening on time such that you actually get the deliverables. And lastly, I've got a, a, a nice picture from the movie Ben-Hur. I, I like this simply because drug, in the business that we are in, which is drug discovery, which is very multifactorial, and a lot of these, which are individual experts on their own, try to pull, uh, pull the uh, wagon. And uh, Judah Ben-Hur, you're right here, is a master craftsman here, who's actually pulling all of them together, and that's the drug discovery expert. And we have a brilliant world-class drug discovery expert within our team, uh, Shahul Hamid, who actually brings, uh, who's that, who, who propels this whole team forward in terms of delivering uh, the goals. The other thing is, as a team, we were not afraid to take, take on global problems. So what does Bugworks do? We are an antibiotics discovery company. And when we say we are an antibiotics discovery company, we are talking of a global challenge. We're not talking of finding solutions for 
Koromangla or Bangalore or, or Chennai. But really, for the for for the large uh, sections of the uh, of an unmet medical need, 30% of I, uh, ICU deaths are due to infections. Uh, and so there are there are some staggering numbers as to why this is a massive global problem, and we've obviously we've decided to take it head on. The other part of the problem is that this is a this is a, a, a timeline and a graph showing from 1900s to 2017, and these are the antibiotics which have actually come into into the marketplace. As you see, there are not that many antibiotics with which we work. However, since the 1990s, that's been a complete drought. And we've actually not had any decent new novel mechanism antibiotic come into. In fact, the last novel mechanism was discovered in 1962. So this is a massive gap. And on the one hand, the problem of infection is getting worse simply because of what is called superbugs. We are losing the existing drugs due to drug resistance. And so the simple treatments are becoming harder and harder to manage. And this impacts the entire clinical practice. So this is a massive global problem and we're staring at a massive uh, pipeline gap. So we are either bold or crazy and we took this problem head on. But how we work is we work, you know, interestingly enough, I want to introduce another concept that you don't have to solve all the problems on your own. So inside Bugworks, we're a very small group. We're, we're less than 20 people. And most of us come from the background of Big Pharma. But what we do inside the company is basically strategize, uh, do the planning, take decisions, bring the investments. But in terms of execution, we work with partners around the globe. We are housed inside what is called C-Camp. We work with two big hospitals in Bangalore and a variety of partners, uh, including some prestigious universities such as the University of Liverpool, Todai, Colorado State, et cetera. And a large part of our work also is funded and helped through the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So we're a very global com company, although very locally located in Bangalore with 20 of us sitting inside in, in C-Camp. Why such an operational model? Of course, I, I described the model itself. It's uh, what we do inside is strategy, risk-taking, decision-making, project management. And the execution of the value addition is through partnerships. Many things are, are uh, become apparent because of this model. One, we keep the capital cost extremely low. Uh, we have not invested in building big verticals to execute a lot of these very high tech science and technology. Instead, we go to where they are already available as either CROs or universities and we tap into those. And so we keep our capital costs low. And being less than 20, we have a very easy human resource management. Uh, because we work with the best, uh, so we actually uh, engage the world-class talent. Uh, and you don't have to have them all under your roof, under your payroll. And, and probably the biggest collateral benefit of this model, which, is, which actually was not intuitive to us when we put this together, but it has become extremely important as we move forward. And that is, I'm going to use this example. Let's take the example of making a product such as a world-class pen. There are many, many parts that go into making a pen. And the way Bugworks operates is that we just engage independent partners, each an expert, to making each of those components. And then what we do inside is bring them all together and then deliver the, the pen. Now, one might say, where is the innovation here? The innovation is actually in making sure that we bring the right component, ask the right questions in terms of the right fit between each of those components, and then propel the, the discovery forward such that the final product is evident. So obviously drug making a pill, making a drug is far more complex than making a pen. And there are many, many, many components that go in, many, many verticals, each a specialization, each, uh, uh, each running into departments or institutions so to speak. When you have to bring all of them together to coalesce them, you can either do it the big pharma model, build very large R&D, build very large capital intensive uh, uh, R&D infrastructure, hire a thousand people, 
and work through talent re uh, retention and etc cetera, etc cetera, all do it in a different way which is completely modular bring individual partners each an expert in a, their own vertical producing different bits of data and all of that data need to beautifully coalesce such that you actually get a pill what is a pill a pill has many properties right and those properties are brought by each of these partners because they are brought by different partners each partner not knowing the other there is an inbuilt robustness in the coalesced data it is not possible to doctor all bits of this puzzle because each of them is sitting in different parts of the world this was probably the biggest collateral benefit that we have, we have realized in working with this very collaborative network model rather than keeping everything inside a single room this strengthens the value the, the, the integrity the robustness of the product that is moving so even if there is a novel product the recommendation that we have is take some parts of it and get somebody else to do it and then as not just someone else but probably two or three different parties to do it such that it is only when a harness product is evolving all of those bits coalesce and so there is an inbuilt robustness built into this operational model the second the other part is that as a startup one of the things that we learned very early on is being responsive to emerging data and not being wedded to our pet hypothesis a few slides ago i i spoke about you know the draft plan which showed up in a, in a piece of paper interestingly that draft plan uh, went 6 feet under very soon after we formed the company it, it was all dead and then you know we we put up another forget about the technical jargon on the slide it just that you know we started something else and that died an investor came something else started a business case something else which started in 2016 is flying very high and uh, that is infused in a very significant investment into the company and uh, and so on and so forth the 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 important thing here is the journey is still continuing to find a drug but the short sound goal we are very brave to keep changing the strategy play change the play in the midfield such that you can make sure that you're not chasing a red herring you're not chasing something which is bound to fail and yet just because i love i started with it i have to live with the data and being adapt uh, adaptive is extremely important in a startup journey because you don't have deep pockets and you have to fail fast and fail cheap such that uh, you want to make sure that the overall investment results in a product raising capital this is probably the most uh, arduous most uh, challenging aspect of a startup you know when most of us came from big pharma honestly we had no idea where the money was coming from there was actually a bottomless pot uh, you know we could demand any experiment it will be done uh, we realized how extremely hard it is to do drug discovery and raising funds was a, a very very difficult challenge and uh, we have been very fortunate to actually tap into a very significant grant network we are very thankful to the department of biotechnology which actually put in the first 50 lakhs into the company and 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 built up to about 2 crore investment into the company and uh, and subsequently significant amount of grant money which is actually enabled if i look at what we have uh, we have raised in the last 5 years 50% of it is grant money and grant money is 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 good in multiple respects one it's free money uh, in the sense that uh, you know there is no equity etc trading or no royalties etc but more importantly the grant process brings in a massive amount of peer review and as a consequence there are very significant technical experts who come in evaluate monitor your progress and make sure you're on track and that ecosystem actually is the biggest benefit in addition to the money that's coming from the grant agencies many kind investors many many kind souls angel investors in fact our first angel investors probably the most endearing story i should i should probably share take a 30 second 
a deviation. Uh, this was a gentleman uh, who was not remotely connected to healthcare, uh, but we were introduced, the three co-founders were introduced to this gentleman and uh, he, uh, out of the goodness of his heart, he said, oh my God, these are middle-aged guys. Let's at least entertain, him, entertain them. So he gave us an hour's audience. It turned out to be a three and a half hour meeting. And uh, at the end of it, he wrote a check. Uh, and with a very clear statement that he said, uh, you know, I'm not looking at uh, multiples or anything. I'm doing it because I think you guys are passionate and this is a moonshot. If something good comes out of it, my investment would have helped mankind. So it was truly an angel investment. And this is probably the best beginning that we've had. Of course, in our journey, we've now have several corporate investors, VCs, and who are very, 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 very thankful to actually uh, Money is coming in from the VCs. This is a this the slide here is is just to indicate what how humbling an experience it is to make a pitch to an investor. So in the very first seed round, which took us about a year and a half to close a seed round, uh, where until then we were basically surviving on grants. Anand and I we probably made over. 200 presentations, uh, probably to maybe uh, as many you know, potential investors. And each presentation, each pitch would be tailored, different, and it was unbelievable the angles, the perspectives from where the questions would come. And it, 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 is, an, it is a learning experience, a very humbling experience because coming from a deep science background, having worked in big pharma, never have to face these kind of uh, non-technical uh, people raising questions. This basically told us, come down your high horse. And uh, you know, this, is, this is not an easy, uh, easy task, yet it has to be done as part of the journey. So making the right pitch. You know, typically tech science startups are founded by enthusiastic individuals or brilliant in their technical area of expertise. There are no question about it. But the problem is, the trap is, I'm the expert, so you have to take my word for it, is a syndrome that as technical experts, we, we fall into. But the problem is, I also don't have the first strings. So you very soon have to learn to distill down the essence of the idea to as much as a common person's lingo, people say elevate a pitch, uh, you know, 30 seconds is all the time you have, sometimes that's all it is, to put it very bluntly, dumb it down. But this is so important, otherwise there's no way anybody's gonna invest. So I would say this is probably the most humbling experience in terms of actually in the startup journey. Uh, everybody should, we, we, we should take the hat of raising funds uh, uh, in, in your startup, because I think that is probably the best uh, life's lesson that you get when, you, when you're trying to raise funds. Probably the significant breakthrough for Bugworks as a journey, uh, this, is, this is not, uh, you know, I mean, this may not apply for everybody, but for us, probably the most significant breakthrough came uh, where we were selected as the only company from Asia to win a substantial grant from a body called Carbex. And Carbex is, uh, is housed at Boston University. It's funded by all those uh, logos shown in the bottom from NIH to Wellcome Trust to Broad Institute, et cetera. And out of the 18 companies which are selected for funding, uh, as you can see, uh, 17 of them are basically Boston, California or Western Europe. And we are the only ones sitting out here in Bangalore. Uh, we, we got funded. Now, the reason to point this out is that, you know, you can sit in Bangalore and do world-class science. And if you do good, good work, people notice you. And that's exactly the point of it, that we do not have to be uh, apologetic. The fact that, oh, I'm sitting here and, you know, you have this challenge, you have that challenge, et cetera, et cetera. But if you put your mind to it, your startup actually can be a global uh, startup uh, and make noise at in the global forum. So we have raised a substantial amount of funding through the Carbex. Uh, I'm pretty much in my last slide. So we have a lot of time for question answers. So what is our business strategy? 
drug discovery is a very, very painfully long game. And probably they, if you look at tech startups to deep science startups, this is the right end of the bell curve, which is probably the most punishing of, of, of having a startup, simply because the concept to a product sometimes is 15 years. Uh, and some people in the audience may have a heart attack when they hear that. And it's also a substantial amount of money that is going in, in terms of actually bringing a concept to a product. So as a startup, what we have decided is that if I divide, that's the top band up there and something you would say is phase one. Phase one is the start of human trials where the product actually is tested in a small group of patients or volunteers. And what we, what we then have is a proof of concept in human patients. And what we intend to do is out license at that stage uh, to big pharma. Uh, and, and for a couple of reasons, one, the big pharma has the infrastructure to do the rest of the development to take a product to registration and have the sales and marketing force, which we do not have any intentions of putting together Secondly, we go back to doing what we know best, which is discovery. Where we are today is at the threshold of that phase one. We are six months away from a phase one. And if all goes well, we're looking at out licensing monetization possibilities this time next year. So that's in a nutshell, our journey in bug works. And just the last few points in terms of a line of sight, you know, startup starts with an idea, obviously, but uh, it's important to make sure that the line of sight is there all the way for a business case. A brilliant idea alone is not sufficient to make a business case. Market and revenue may seem very distant at the time of inception, but they are as important as the technical idea. And it's very important to keep that in mind because there is no point in making a world-class product which nobody else wants. Because if no one wants it, there's no business case. And when there is no business case, there's no point making that product. Build and they will come is a very famous uh, phrase in the movie field of dreams. It's a, you know, it's sort of the antithesis of my previous statement, but I believe that that is a very tough proposition. It's not always pragmatic because if you don't have an idea who the customer is at the end, it's very difficult to actually justify any kind of investment to make even if it is a world-class product or an idea that you have. Yet breakthrough innovation only stems from the adage invention is the mother of necessity. I know when we were growing up, necessity is the mother of in invention is what we have been taught. But I think that's, uh, that's, old, uh, that's passe. Uh, in invention is the mother of necessity. And the classic example is a smartphone. I, I don't think uh, uh, 20, 10 years ago, we thought a phone could actually do all these things in our hand. And today, by bringing this whole business of apps by Apple has turned it upside down, right? We have created new needs with that smartphone. Uh, so invention is the mother of necessity. So, and that's how breakthrough innovation comes. Thank you all for listening and I'm here to take questions. And that's my team. Lots of questions. Can I start with the bottom? <laughs> Great question. How is bug work surviving without any revenue? Yeah, true. So we're still uh, very cost intensive. We are raising, as I had, uh, as I had explained, uh, we, uh, uh, because it's a very public health problem that we're dealing with. Uh, we have some money is equity based. So there are still investors uh, who, who think that this is something which is very important and who are plugging in money. Obviously we can't go on uh, forever. So we are looking at hopefully a monetization somewhere around the bend, as I said, about a year's time. How you distribute the equity share at starting? Yeah, so the co-founders, most of it, we, we put in very little money as co-founders, but we basically worked without salaries for a couple of years. And the equity share was, uh, I think 
I, I don't remember the exact specifics. It was based on uh, the amount of quantum of money uh, that is bought in by each of the investors. That's how the equity was distributed in the beginning. And obviously, subsequent rounds of investment have continuously diluted it. Subhabrata. In India, the people are more underprivileged. How do you think? Ah, okay. So this model business, well, this business model is actually for driving innovation and bringing products. Uh, now, even if you are bringing solutions for the underprivileged, the solution per se has to be very good, right? Just because they are underprivileged, you can't sell them a cheap product. This, when I say cheap, uh, cheap in terms of quality, cheap in terms of performance. Uh, anybody deserves a good quality product. And this business model allows you to bring that good quality product. And that is the key thing. Uh, what is the estimated? Well, okay. What is the estimated break-even period for bug works? We, we, we are an intellectual property based company and our uh, IP is our asset. So we're looking at an uh, hockey stick model. Uh, we either make it big or we go six feet under. And we're talking about a year from now, uh, you know, if everything goes well, we probably, our asset is probably, uh, you know, half a billion dollars worth um, because it will be a first of its kind in about 50 years, uh, the mankind has seen, uh, but only time will tell. If it bombs, that's it. We go on to do other things. Most of the big hospitals not really think about the hospital. Like, oh, I think uh, that's not entirely true. Many hospitals are extremely aware of it. They just don't want to make it public simply because it's a, it's a marketing nightmare. What happens is if, if uh, it, it, it is counter uh, productive in terms of uh, bringing clients. Um, and so this is uh, usually kept under wraps and they work in the background in terms of minimizing and, and eliminating uh, bacterial infections in the hospital environment. Uh, they just don't talk about it because uh, it's not received well by patients. Do you feel that caretakers really think about this? Uh, I, I presume you're talking of caregivers. Yes, they do. Doctors, for example, are extremely cognizant of this problem because they know, uh, you know, for example, we, we, uh, one of our advisors is Devi Shetty. Uh, we work closely with Narana uh, Health. And he often says that, you know, a, a patient comes in, undergoes, spends 20, 30 lakhs, gets a fantastic, uh, you know, valve replacement surgery, uh, only to lose that patient two days later to a stupid infection, as he calls it, which uh, if you had an antibiotic would cost you 100 rupees to cure. The problem is today, we do not have antibiotics which still tackle those infections. And so you, in effect, you've lost a 20 lakh, 30 lakh uh, expenditure for potentially a 100 rupee solution. And so caregivers, doctors very much think about this. I don't see any other questions. Yeah. Yes, new discovery time and yes, very true. Uh, new discovery is, uh, is uh, consumes time. It's high risk and high investment, no doubt about it. Uh, so the, the problem with re-engineering existing antibiotics, which is what the industry has milked for the last 30 years or so, making variants and variants and variants trying to beat the resistance problem. But the bacteria are smarter and smarter. So what they're doing is basically we're sort of running out of options of re-engineering existing antibiotics simply because the bacteria are just finding ways of conquering them. So the time has come where uh, we have, the world needs another set of about a half a dozen novel mechanisms, uh, novel antibiotics, uh, which will take us for the next few decades. So if you look back in history, basically we had about five to six mechanisms which have been milked in a class of about 30 to 40 antibiotics 
that has actually saved us for the next for the last 70 80 years so these are once you make a novel product they actually sit with you for a long time as opposed to a, 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 a you know a mobile phone which goes obsolete in six months um, it's high risk high investment but it's also high return simply because uh, it stays on for a very long time how clinical trial on human works well you basically uh, Absolutely, there are very set principles, uh, practices, which are governed by what is called regulatory agencies in every country, which sets up processes such that you, uh, you, uh, you bring in patients and test your new compound. It goes through a, pro a stepwise process called phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one, you look at very, very small numbers, and then phase two, you climb up, and phase three, you look at multiple sets of populations, et cetera, across, across the globe. And, and in during this process, you not only assess for the effectiveness of your drug, but more importantly, you, you look at the safety, that is the adverse events. Are they, is there a risk versus benefit case that the regulatory agency will look at it? And only then a drug then gets approved. Do you sign NDA? Of course, with every very uh, with every entity, we uh, we we sign an NDA, and uh, and most of our partners. So there's a question here: is if not, is there a chance of intellectual theft? Great question. So the for us, the intellectual property is basically the chemical structure, and the chemical structure partnership is actually with only one other entity, and we work with that in terms of a very close relationship. All of the partnerships are blind to that chemical structure. So the data on their own, which is basically biological properties on their own are worth nothing. Uh, it's actually when you're married with a chemical structure that there is actually into property. The second thing what we do is that we, uh, we obviously patent and we already have four different patent families. And so at this point, uh, uh, you know, the risk of intellectual theft is extremely small. How do you go about while applying for a patent? Well, patent, the standard principles of novelty, innovation, and industrial application, all those apply. And we basically, uh, uh, the, the, because the design of the chemical moiety is done inside the company, the chemical, the, the intellectual property resides within the company. People who are doing outside are executing our plans. They are actually not designing the compounds. The design of the, the, the novel drug is actually inside the company and that is the only intellectual property how clinical trial works i think i just said that uh, how are you voting your team oh yeah brilliant so that's a great question you know i think the fact that we are addressing a very significant global problem and we have a unique opportunity to actually make a difference to we're talking of mankind for the next probably 100 years this is motivating enough uh, and in the sense that People, everybody that we've engaged are scientists. And uh, uh, except for one person who's an administrative help, all the rest of us are scientists. And for scientists to have uh, the, the ability, to, even the, the possibility that they will impact mankind and probably much long after they're gone is a significant motivating factor. And in fact, as a scientist, you must be crazy because 99% of the time, a scientist actually only faces failures. That's true for any science because science definition of a scientist is you're, you're pushing the boundary, you're looking at the unknown and nine out of 10 times, you don't know what the hell you're doing. As a consequence, we're, we're very tuned to looking at failures. So the fact that you're addressing a very global unmet medical need is a significant motivation. Is it only your market? Oh yeah, there are plenty of competition. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the, I showed a slide in terms of Carbex uh, today, Carbex funds about 30 companies around the globe. We're still the only one from Asia, Africa, Australia, this part of the world. But all those other companies are all competitive, uh, competitors. And uh, unfortunately, uh, none that I could say uh, significantly in India, but most of it from uh, Western Europe and North America. How am I doing with time? What are you, oh yeah. 
what are my views on MDR, XDR, TB? Huge growing problem. Uh, uh, numbers are climbing drastically and uh, significant unmet medical need, both MDR, XDR, TB and MRSA. And clearly the, uh, the, the TB part of it we're not addressing, but MRSA is something that we are addressing. And uh, in addition to these that you've mentioned, the biggest cluster of superbugs, the gram negative bacteria, uh, the E. coli's of the world are actually the biggest problem today. And, uh, and that's why we are in it in terms of finding the new antibiotics. I think the need for bug works is more in the government hospitals. So we approach, yeah, see the, pro the thing is, government hospital requires solutions. We are still in the journey of making a solution. When our product actually is registered, we will work towards making it accessible and available uh, for all who needs it, right? So this is not just a premium product that they're looking at. We're, obviously, infection is a huge uh, burden in countries such as ours and in Africa and China, et cetera, where there are large populations. So we will certainly work with government hospitals. But in the current journey, our only engagement with the hospital is basically testing our, our, our concept in a very small number of uh, patients. Apart from that, when the product is ready, we will obviously work with government hospitals. I think, uh, yeah, could you please share tough, oh yeah, tough, <laughs> tough experience. There were several. Um, okay, some of the things are, uh, one of the things that straight away uh, I would say is that within five minutes of a presentation, uh, the investor is telling on your face, and ah, it's not going to work. And it's a when it's a blanket statement, it's not even defensible. Uh, it, you can't even argue that. And that's then becomes an extremely tough meeting uh, because when the investor is pointing out saying, and they, they look at you and say, oh, this is not going to work. And they face then their own cohort in terms of the other people in the room. And they are having a, a discussion saying that why this is a crazy idea and we're not going to. So this has happened several times. And, and, and the challenge we've learned is our inability, as I said, to dumb it down such that this problem is actually appearing as a surmountable problem. Uh, and so uh, the, the toughest experience is actually being able to get that message across. Yes, this requires great solutions. And yet, and yes, we have the wherewithal to do it. So probably the biggest challenges have been the kind of audience uh, where they're dismissing you within, you know, within the first five minutes. Uh, and some of them are very, very respectable, very reputed investors. Uh, and that, that, but that it is what it is. What make me quit my job? Well, got bored. Uh, very simple. Uh, got bored doing the same thing. And I was very much doing management, uh, just people management. And I had uh, sort of lost touch with uh, my core area in terms of actually uh, wetting hands in science and startup opportunity actually brought back that excitement in, in actually being very close to science and very close to the action. Uh, with all due respect to you know, uh, people managers, I found it uh, actually quite taxing and I, I quit. What is the benefit for mechanical in this, in this session, sir? Because I'm being, oh yeah, sure. See, okay. I'm sorry that I, I, I tried not to keep it very technical and my, I hope what I was trying to share was some of the principles of a startup, uh, such as you know, forming a team. And if you're a mechanical engineer with an idea of forming a startup, the lesson for me, uh, for the, 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 the message that I would give is that don't find three more mechanical engineers all from your same batch and try to form a startup. Because what happens is you're very much uh, all clones are the same and you do not have broader perspectives because there are multiple aspects which go into making a startup. Fundraising, you know, pitching, uh, building networks, collaborations, technical wherewithal, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that is at least one aspect that came out where you would see that making a startup, try to get a heterogeneous team to act and work out as a team, not as an individual to fight the battles. The second thing I would say is that have the tenacity, have the, the guts 
to keep changing, being responsive to the data that is emerging, uh, and so that you're willing to keep shaping, reshaping your prototype, right? You may have started out with a certain design in mind for a, for a particular product, but if you realize that there are major glitches, don't be afraid to change the blueprint completely and start off in a different angle. Because what is important is the end goal and be prepared to make course corrections as you go along. I hope at least these two uh, would, would have some benefit in terms of the context that you're looking at. What kind of antibiotic, the kind of, what kind of antibiotic Bugworks is trying to make? We're actually making a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, for those of you who may have used, uh, you know, you've got an infection and you've probably been prescribed something called suprafloxacin or, you know, sifran or amoxicillin, for example, augmentin, some of these names you may have heard, Bactrim. Uh, we're trying to make the next generation of antibiotics belonging to that type where it can work against all types of infections. So it's a broad spectrum infection, which a doctor, what happens in a lot of infections, the response time where the patient is coming and where it's going to become very serious and sometimes fatal is 48, 72 hours. So even today, most clinicians prefer what is called a carpet bombing approach. That is, I need to hit it hard, I need to hit it fast. And I need to hit everything that could possibly be causing the problem here. So what we call as broad spectrum antibiotic, and that's what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to address, the, because of the properties that we have discovered in the molecule that we are moving forward, it actually is applicable in a variety of infectious diseases, such as urinary tract, pneumonia, intra-abdominal, skin, burn wounds, uh, endocarditis, name it it will have an application. And that is the type of product that we're trying to, and that's the properties that we have. And that's why, uh, that's why if it is successful and we get the pro positive proof of concept, we're really looking at a half a billion dollar value, a product in terms of a market value. Can you tell us about uh, <laughs> Bugworks expansion plans? That's a great question. You know, one of the key, one of the decisions as founders we made was that keep this ship very tight. Uh, our expansion plan is more in terms of engaging, uh, bringing more projects, addressing more therapeutic areas, and as a consequence, engaging more and more people outside. So within Bugworks, we probably will remain the same sort of numbers, but our expansion will be in terms of portfolio therapy areas, and as a consequence, the number of people outside will be working for us. Just to put it in perspective, as on, if I take today, uh, there are probably over 300 people around the globe who are working for Bugworks. They're not on Bugworks' as payroll directly, but indirectly, right? We engage them as, as partners. So hopefully that 300 will grow to 1,000. And that we're talking of deep science, intellectual uh, sort of uh, product development. And that's the sort of expansion plan we're looking at. Hopefully, we will also, uh, as... Uh, as co-founders, other, the other dream that we have is to mushroom a few more bug works around, especially India, where the culture of innovation, especially in drug discovery, is extremely, extremely shallow, extremely uh, nascent. And we hope to uh, you know, make other bug works emerge in the, in the ecosystem. That's the expansion we're looking at, not, in direct, not directly inside. Why you chose Bangalore? Oh, more, all of us have been living in Bangalore for a long time, as simple as that. Uh, and uh, Bangalore is a, so where we, where we are, more importantly, where are we housed today? We are housed inside a place called CCAMP, inside National Center for Biological Sciences. This is a fantastic ecosystem for a startup, especially a life science startup. There are about 80 companies within that cluster. There are some world-class, academic groups in, the, in that campus. And probably the best, one of the best infrastructure globally. So uh, you have a ready actualization of ideas, uh, you know, state-of-the-art infrastructure. You can bounce off ideas with, with people across uh, different skill sets, different, uh, you know, backgrounds. Uh, my, my, one of my good friends will say the accidental collisions of the mind 
It happens all the time in NCBS, in coffee rooms and corridors. And these are people coming from very different uh, you know, backgrounds. That is a strength. And that is probably the biggest reason why we are where we are. And we hope to be there for quite some time because I think that is an extremely thriving and a fantastic ecosystem to be. Again, for the mechanical engineer, that's another thing that I would say a start, for a startup, it's better to be a part of a larger ecosystem rather than doing it alone in a shed or, or, or a living room because uh, inside your own entity, you may have very few minds, but being a part of a larger ecosystem gives you access to other minds who are freely giving you, you know, gyan and uh, sometimes extremely useful gyan. And so that's an enormous benefit of being in where we are today in terms of CCAM. <laughs> How do we keep more? Well, hopefully opportunities like this to talk to people uh, keeps us motivated. Uh, as a scientist, I told you 99 out of 100 times we actually face failure. So sort of we become thick skin to it. How do we keep, main, keep uh, our motivation up? We always keep the end in sight. We know what we are up to, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to deliver, which is the patients, um, which is a drug, which hopefully will serve mankind for a long, long time. And that in itself keeps us awake all the time. Sure. Uh, somebody has asked a question, in addition to working on an antibiotic, can we work on something to identify in less than an hour? Sort of, yes, that's a different seg segment in terms of diagnostics. And uh, we, as individual scientists, some of us are engaged in, in advisory roles in such entities. Bugworks is not uh, engaged in a diagnostic setup, but what you said is absolutely nail on the head. The most important tool for a doctor is to know within an hour what he's dealing with. Somebody said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, uh, so thank you all uh, for attending the session and especially thanks to uh, Dr. Bala uh, for making it here. In case you have any more questions or queries, you can drop us an email at ngac at the red nmims.edu and we will make our best efforts to answer you back. Thank you once again. Yeah, I'm going to go.